All right, let's get started then. Okay, so we, uh, this is uh, ses the second session, and uh, this is uh, Women in U.S. History of Cartography. Um, so, so you cannot have a conference on gender, sexuality, and cartography without addressing the role of women in cartography, and uh, particularly U.S. history here. And as Katie alluded to yesterday, uh, you actually cannot have a conference on cartography and not address uh, women's role. Um, it is also uh, not by accident that Susan Schulten began the conference, uh, giving us a sense of women's role in map drawing, geography, and um, generally women's education in the 18th and 19th century. So, uh, Our panel today has uh, three speakers. Uh, first, uh, Christina Dando will talk about highly gendered practices of geography and cartography, termed by some as women's work. Uh, second, uh, Patricia Seed will talk about two women stalwarts of science, Marie Thorpe and Irene Fisher, who did pioneering work in ocean floor mapping and geodetic models, uh, respectively. Um, and lastly, we had on the roster uh, Judith Tyner. Uh, unfortunately, uh, she had to cancel very last minute uh, due to a medical emergency. Uh, she's fine. She's recuperating. She just cannot travel at this time. Uh, so our very own Katie Parker is going to be, I should say, have the privilege of being Judy Tyner's <laughs> proxy, and we'll read from Judith's paper. Um, so if you have any questions for Judith, uh, let Katie or I know, and we'll put you in touch with her. Um, Judith's paper focuses on the role of three women in pictorial cartography, uh, Ruth Taylor White, Louise Jefferson, and Alva Scott uh, Garfield, who, uh, who did work ranging uh, between the you know, 1920s and 1950s. Um, so that's what we have. So we're going to uh, begin uh, with Christina Danto. Uh, so Christina Danto is Professor of Geography and incoming Chair of the Geography slash Geology Department, University of Nebraska, Omaha. Dando is the author of Women in Cartography in the Progressive Era, published in 2018. Uh, she's currently expanding her, this research, uh, considering the maps and geographies created and circulated by minority Americans of the era and preparing an article on anti-lynching maps. Uh, in addition to her map history work, Dando studies the impacts of media uh, and technology on human perception and interception, oh, I'm sorry, and interaction with the environment and the intersections of landscape, media, and gender, often considering the Great Plains and American West landscapes. So without further ado, Christina Dando and Science of Princes versus Women's Work, Gender and Map or Mapping in the Progressive Era. To begin, I want to say just how deeply grateful I am to be invited to join this. Um, ah. It went to questions. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> We're not wow! There. Wow! I was You're so done. nervous. You're I'm already so done. Fast. <laughs> you are so fast. Oh my goodness! How did that happen? I didn't even know this possible. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay, thank you. So I, I'm just very deeply grateful to be invited to, to be here today and to be such a, among such a fabulous group of papers. I've just been astounded by, by all I've heen, seen and, and heard today and last night. And I also want to, to thank uh, the late David Woodward and his lovely wife, Roz, and the History of Cartography Project. Um, I wouldn't be here today if David and Roz hadn't encouraged my interest in women in mapping. And um, introduced me to the work of people like Judy Tyner, and it took me a long time, but I, I think I finally found my way. This Rand McNally ad from a 1924 National Geographic captures the gendered Western stereotypes of those who map. Map creation and use are, con are associated with men, the science of princes, with our modern princes here surveying territory as they discuss world events. The women may not be absorbed in the map, but they're clearly engaged turned and listening, and um, Margaret, if you notice, they're, they're doing needlework. It just made me think of your image this morning. Um, 
The Progressive Era, roughly 1890 to 1920, was a time when many Americans became actively engaged in improving their communities, often using maps in their work. Today I'm going to be looking at the gendering of cartography in this time period, and by gendering I mean the association of something with a particular gender, like a career, like an elementary school teacher being associated with women, or the color blue being associated with boys. Maps have been made by humans for ever, knows, and we, we know this is to facilitate spatial understandings, and that spatial understanding might be of spiritual realms, or it could be how to get from one place to another, or the best locations for a camp. Map production came to be associated with the control of territory and space practiced by navigators, explorers, businessmen, and those working for those in power, such as kings and emperors. As such, cartography came to be associated with men and masculine knowledge. In the progressive era in America, we have two distinct practices of cartography developing, those by men extending a practice they had been engaged with for centuries, but also a growing practice by women. How do these parallel practices, um, how are they constructed in the progressive era? So I'll begin by looking at the development of cartography in the United States and its portrayal in the popular press, looking at the construction of a cartographer and who makes maps and works with maps, and then we'll look at women and their mapping practices. While men were stereotypical cartographers, women were making maps and increasingly being recognized for their work. To even use the word cartography, is to evoke the mythology of the idealized map and its maker. And of course, a huge shout out to Matthew Edney and his book, and there's so many resonances I see with, with what he has been working on. Much of the history of cartography has been written in the past focusing on big important maps or mapping projects, which combines our view of cartography and geography to the science of princes, to those idealized maps created by explorers, governments, commercial interests, wielded by kings, presidents, sometimes queens, governments and deposited and preserved in major archives and collections. Geography and maps have long been a form of knowledge essential to the control of space and resources. They're crucial to the maintenance of state power, as Brian Harley famously wrote, and are a form of power in their own right, through which they control space, in control information, and the world is standardized. Maps were created in this mythology for men, by men, for men, I said that before, only a handful of scholars have considered the gendered construction of cartography. Uh, Dalia Varenka's essay, The Manly Map from 2009, begins to address the implications of masculine cartographic style, paralyzing the rise of modern, modern cartography and the rise of masculine ideals, focusing on 17th century English maps and texts. Over geography's history, there has been two central ways that geography was practiced. In, the interest in measuring the world and assisting through that measurement with navigation, and an interest in places and peoples and what made them unique. And this mapping was used to understand both of these aspects. Just as geography can trace its roots back to the ancient Greeks, so too can the word cartography, with um, charts, cart from papyrus leaf and graphen to describe. In the 17th century, map making was shifting from the art to a science, particularly that increased focus on science and the mathematical calculation of latitude and longitude, which of course led, led to greater moral authority on mapping. The term cartography really comes into broader use in the early 19th century, apparently simultaneously in French and German. With the development of academic cartography in the 19th and 20th century, we also need to draw mapping into this more academic realm. When we consider Cartography Day, it was a practice of a variety of disciplines. Oh, sorry, skipped a page. Hang on. All right. There we go. Um, what we consider Cartography Day was a practice of, I'm all confused now. All right, there we go, there we go. Using Erwin Royce's 1937 diagram, we can break the concept of maps into the explorers and surveys who compiled the data and created the maps, the artisans working in the print shops, the private cartographers who were crafting and printing maps. We have eventually the state and with the uh, surveyors uh, working for governments, the practice of early geography, and all of this were part of the masculine spheres of influence. Early surveyors began their education in schools with mathematics and were apprenticed or trained on the job. George Washington in the upper left, 
uh, be, was believed to have started her serving in his teens as part of school exercises and, and was eventually taken out on a survey expedition um, with his family friend, George Fairfax. Um, in the lower left, Lewis and Clark, William Clark, it's believed that he learned on the Virginia frontier, quite possibly trained with his brother, who was a surveyor. Um, Meriwether Lewis was trained in land serving in Philadelphia with Andrew Endicott, one of the foremost surveyors in the United States. Um, topographical engineering, upper right, was taught at West Point through, and at the US Army Corps of Engineers. And that included things like field surveying, field sketching, map reading inter and interpretation, and map production. American expansion led to great need for trained surveyors and engineers as canals, railroads, and eventually roads and highways spread across the country. As higher education developed and as the training of specialized fields like engineering became standardized, it was professionalized. That is, it developed a culture of work trust, ethics, professional associations, licensing, collegial control, client, uh, pract client practitioner relations, and in the process became ossified as thoroughly male and a middle class endeavor. Margaret Rossiter writes that the very word professional was in time, in some contexts, a synonym for an all masculine and so high status organization. Academic geography was largely a 20th century phenomenon. When the Association of American Geographers was founded in 1904, there was no cartographic profession in the United States, according to Arthur Robinson, with much of the government mapping being done by engineers and draftsmen and some thematic cartography done by academics. McMaster and Thrower suggest that the first genuine American academic cartographer was J. Paul Good at the University of Chicago. So this is Paul Good here, and I believe it's there also. He taught the first, for sure, course in a cartography at an American university. Prior to World War II, demand for maps was great, but there were, as again, Arthur Robinson, there were no cartographers as we know them today, with most having drafting experience, but not geography experience. William Morris Davis griped in 1895 about the training of topographic surveyors, complaining that they spent so much time on mathematics and techniques that they neglect, quote, the surface of the earth and the expression of its wonderfully modeled, modulated forms, end quote. This developing field of geography and cartography was predominantly male. Women were excluded from geodesy, topography, and physical geography, and a lot of this was tied to military hands. Two women were members, original, of the Association of American Geographers when it was founded in 1904, out of 48 and one of which was Ellen Churchill Semple, which is the lady in the group on the left, I mean right. In the media, the assumption was surveying and cartography, people who made maps were male. Articles that discuss maps and map making inevitably discuss male creators and use masculine pron pronouns. A 1901 article in the, on the transformation of the map in Scribner's mag magazine meditates on the geopolitical changes in the world map from 1825 to 1900, Riley observing, quote, the symmetrical slicing of the African pie vividly suggests a careful arrangement among boys as to the division of a prize which they have yet to obtain. A 1918 article in the New York Times on American Geographical Society's inquiry and their setting off to the Paris peace talks describes all the notable men involved and the maps being transported to Paris as part of their efforts. The two women geographers that were involved were never mentioned. The history of cartography and advances in cartography were also widely discussed. Articles on the history of maps appeared in magazines such as Harper's Monthly in 1902, Scientific American in 1907, The New York Times in 1924 with geographers like Ptolemy, Magnus, and Cortez named. In a New York Times article, Milner Dory writes, quote, a map is the most alluring product of the pen. Insatiable men would either tra traverse every foot of the Earth's surface or pry into its secrets, or in imagination, rove to distant lands and days. To satisfy his wanderlust, he, makes or he finds or makes a map. If he cannot go in flesh, map in hand, he goes in spirit, end quote. Articles on the latest techniques in cartography were also discussed in the popular press, with the one to one million map and the use of aerial images discussed. A New York Times um, article discusses the one to one million map with quotes from Herman Gaunt of the US Geological Survey. Um, the use of aer aer aerial photography was widely covered in the media in 
the magazine Current Opinion, in Illustrated World, and in Sunset Magazine. In Sunset, there's a quote from the author, Fred Vincent, that quote, cities turn into squat squares, boulevards into slender threads, and as for the imperial man, he simply cannot be seen at all. To the layman, it is all very confusing. To the aerial map maker, it is as clear as crystal. The photograph, a tool by which he surveys a vast and oft times inaccessible lands and provides engineering data of inestimable value for mankind's constructive enterprises." End quote. While the Sunset Magazine article used the term map maker, the word cartographer was not unusual. A 1908 New York Times article on an explorer of Columbia described a Mr. Hamilton Rice as the famous explorer, cartographer, and ethnographer. A brief in the New York Times from 1914 describes the, the um, opportunities in civil service and that a competitive exam for cartographer in agricultural science for men only will be held July 13th. When cartographers are mentioned, it's almost always the very famous, such as Major Lambton and Colonel Everest of India, or the work of Mungo Park, Becke, Livingston, Speck, and Grant in Africa. And of course, then we have the advertisements from Rand McNally, which further associates the maps and mapping with masculine ideals of early explorers like Columbus, with young men of action, and with risky survey expeditions. This 1914 Schlitz Atlas was produced by a partnership of Schlitz and Rand McNally, uniting two major American companies in support of US military engagement in Mexico, capitalizing on American interest in the Mexican situation. This is just a repackaging, really, of standard Rand McNally reference maps, overprinted with data about the Mexican Revolution leaders, the territories they controlled, the territories they didn't control. So if you look at Yucatan, it actually says in rebellion. This captures the spectrum of hegemonic masculine practices of cartography in the progressive era. Can you get any more masculine than beer-worn maps? <laughs> the phrase women's work could mean the work that women did in the home cooking, cleaning, laundry, but it also could refer to the work that women conducted outside the home, work that women reviewed, were viewed as uniquely qualified to carry out. In the 1890s, there we go. Women took on a greater public role, still associated, associated with home and domestic issues, but working with women's organizations to bring about social change. They had education, they might work outside the home, they had fewer children, and they became involved in a wide range of activities, from charitable to political. By focusing on municipal housekeeping, such as education, sanitation, food safety, women could work toward improving their cities and society while still being perceived as proper women and mothers. Women's clubs and organizations advocated for women to investigate for themselves the problems in their communities, could be garbage, could be dance halls, and then work towards solutions. And maps and geography were part of this, their activism. The rise of women's work coincided with changes in map production. Erwin Royce again, in 1937, commented on how the introduction of photo engraving led to, quote, an enormously widespread application of maps, and that, quote, the resulting maps may be less perfect technically, but they will more informally express geographical ideas." End quote. Women were trained in map making in elementary and secondary school, just as men were as part of their geography lessons. Map drawing was, even in the progressive era, still part of geographic education. As we, to draw back to Susan's work from yesterday, geography textbooks included directions for map sketching exercises. Supplemental materials for geography classes included books like Tracing and Sketching, Lessons in Geography, that were produced to meet a demand for teaching materials. Chico State Normal School produced a bullet in 1912 on map geography that, quote, was designed as a labor-saving device for the teachers who ordinarily has more than she can do without overtaxing her nervous nervous system. And that was tested in San Diego, San Francisco schools and in the state schools at large. While Paul Good is largely associated with the projections he developed and also the Ray McNally Atlas, atlases he created, he also published articles on, quote, the function of map drawing in the teaching of geography. That's from 1904. 
As women's higher education expanded from the opening of women's seminaries and colleges, a background in geography, in maps and mapping, was expected for admission, and it also then formed a core component of the curriculum. But training in maps and map making was not limited to schools and universities. Women in social there you go. Women in social activism set settings encouraged others to map. Jane Adams and Hull House residents have, de have been described as being enchanted with mapping. As they worked to improve their communities, they went out and conducted research on the communities and mapped the results. And that was often the very first thing that they did. In their publications, they created maps and used maps in their work. And in their, in, of course, this very well, of course, their best known uh, maps. There's also a very detailed um, one over on the, on the right. You should very definitely check that out. This was described as an illustration of a method of research. They encouraged other social settlements and other women's groups that were interested in improving their communities to use this as a method to get at, at their, the problems they were trying to do. While Hull House was the first social settlement in the United States, by 1910 there were over 400 in the United States. Those with the resources followed Hull House's examples and used mapping. Other areas where women encouraged other women to map included suffrage work, social activism, and we would say missionary support. So with the suffrage movement, women wrote into the suffrage magazines and encouraged other suffragists to make maps. In this case, it's Lavinia Dock. She described and wrote into the suffrage magazine on how she created a walking suffrage map and that she would wear it as she walked the city streets and that, quote, men are much impressed by the ocular proof of our advance. In the center, this is from a brochure that the YWCA created on directions for making exhibit maps, so providing this information to other YWCA chapters. And on the right, we have a stand-in for mission maps. Mission maps, mission education was an important aspect. It almost was National Geographic before National Geographic. And they described how maps were essential for teaching about where missions were and what the, the missionaries needed. Lesson plans stated, quote, use maps. Have at least a map of the world. Make them if you cannot buy them. And directions were provided on how the women could make maps. There were directions for the map committees. So once introduced to mapping, what did they do with them? Well, this can be broken down into really two broad categories. And the first we would describe as women's work. As teacher education developed over the 19th century, women joined the faculty of normal schools and teachers' colleges to train others in educational practices. A survey of teachers' colleges from 1928 that found out of 83 schools, 37 offered more than seven classes in geography to their students. Now, none appeared to have been specifically cartography or map making, but still, the, that much geography was huge. At the Chicago Normal School, training in geography teaching included labs on sand modeling, chalk modeling, paper mache, map projections, and diagrammatic outlines of continents. The faculty at normal schools was predominantly women, representing 60% of normal school faculties. Women dominated, dominated the National Council of Geography Teachers. In 1917, that would be approximately two-thirds of the membership. And note that these are both images from historically black colleges and universities. Both offered a normal school track to their students as well as an academic, trade school, religious education tracks. And geography coursework was part of all the tracks. Following Hull House's lead, social settlements and early practitioners of social work created maps as part of their efforts to understand their communities. Here we have examples of social settlement mapping from the University of Chicago from the College Women's Club of San Diego, from the right, from Philadelphia, and from the top, this is from um, Survey Magazine's special issue on the Negro in the Cities of the North, that is the title. On the right, Sadie um, Moselle's work. Sadie would go on to be the first black American to hold both a PhD and a JD degree. Daughters of the American Revolution, 
a servant, women's service organization composed of members of revolutionary, of descendants of revolutionary war patriots. Their, I'm oh, sorry, Kansas, Minnesota, and Missouri DAR chapters all took on projects mapping roads and trails in their states. While men were hired to produce the final published maps, the DAR chapters made clear that they instigated the work, conducted the research into where these roads and trails were, and that the maps were theirs. In Kansas, a prominent newspaper man and politician questioned why DAR was named first on the Granite Santa Fe trail markers, to which he was told, quote, why man, the state of Kansas has had this trail for nearly 50 years and lost it. The daughters of the American Revolution in Kansas found it. With the women's suffrage movement, maps were used extensively as both a rhetorical and a strategic tool. The suffrage map, updated with every state won in the battle, was used nationwide as part of their campaign for the vote, often with the slogan, the map proves it. In this case, the map was employed as what the women called optical proof that suffrage worked. Would a state pass suffrage if it saw chaos and disaster in the neighboring state that had passed it? No. Success of suffrage, suffrage in a state, they argued, has led to neighboring states following suit. Imitation is the sincerest flattery. They also use maps as part of their campaign strategies, as in the Iowa example on the right, using maps to assess the lay of the land and determine where they needed to concentrate their efforts. Slowly, the suffrage movement gained momentum, the 19th Amendment winning, going into effect in August 1920. Much of the work there we go. I've discussed so far falls into the realm of traditional women's work, work that for the most part could be considered feminine. But they were also engaged with what could be considered masculine cartography work, or what William Morris Davis called professional geography. Women were involved in the advancement of mathematics and astronomies by serving as human computers, doing the laborious computations needed for mathematics and astronomy. At the Harvard Observatory, women were hired to carefully examine photographic images of stars on glass plates and to measure the brightness and catalog uh, to measure and catalog the brightness of stars from 1877 to 1919 it's estimated that more than 80 women worked there Henrietta Leavitt began as one such computer and this is her right here. she would go on to not only be one of these computers but discover a way to measure beyond the universe and begin to map the universe Harlow Shapley and Edward Hubble used her work to map the universe. Her contributions were acknowledged with a Nobel Prize nomination in 1925, which unfortunately had to be withdrawn because she had died four years before. As computing became more complex, demanding higher skilled, better paid workers, it was upgraded to men's work. Despite surveying being constructed as a masculine practice by the progressive era, women were making inroads. Grace Raymond Hebbard was the rare individual who engaged in what we might describe as both masculine and feminine mapping. Hebbard was born in Iowa and was the first woman to graduate from the University of Iowa with an engineering degree. Her coursework including classes in surveying and mechanical drawing. She migrated westward with her family to Iowa in 1850, 1882 and took a position as a draftsman in the United States Survey General's office in Cheyenne, producing maps from surveyors' notes. She eventually became the deputy state engineer. 1891, she moved to Laramie, began to work at the University of Wyoming, and began to also do research and publish on Wyoming history. Her work on the Oregon Trail actually meshes DAR work in Wyoming with her interest in Wyoming history. She was the state regent of the Daughters of the American Revolution. She was secretary of the Wyoming Oregon Trail Commission. She mapped the Oregon and Bozeman trails to produce her histories, and she wrote the report on the marking of the trails. Hebbard describes how the Oregon Trail map, this one here, had its beginnings with a map made by the Western explorer Jim Bridger. But from the map, you can see it quite clearly. She takes full credit. Hebbard was not the only woman in American surveying. A brief article on, on employments for women in the suffrage magazine, The Woman's Journal, suggests that in 1895, 177 women were working as engineers and surveyors in the United States. Ava Weed, a Brooklyn, New York woman, made news in 1895 when she was appointed draftswoman in the Bureau of Sewers for Brooklyn after receiving the highest score on a civil service exam. In 
This was first covered by the Women's Journal in the upper left. It was then picked up and ran in the New York Times in the lower left. It ran in the Omaha Daily Bee in the upper right. So this, in other words, was picked up and I won't say it went viral, but you definitely have it being picked up and run in multiple newspapers. At the center, we have a, a entry from the Brooklyn Daily Eagle Almanac, and notice that she is making the same as the men, which I think is quite remarkable. And in the lower right, we have her, the news of her work as a draftsman going international in this um, Annette Menken's Women in Transition published in London in 1907. Laura Whitlock arrived in Los Angeles in 1895 with her mother and began leading tours around Southern California. She eventually opened her own travel and hotel bureau in Los, Los Angeles in 1903 and published a guide to California complete with a map of Los Angeles. She was eventually designated the official map maker of Los Angeles County and new editions of her map were released up until 1919. When her map was pirated and sold around the city, Whitlock sued the pirate for copyright violation and after a three-year battle, won, setting a national precedent for copyright protection of maps for cartographers. Note that she is described as a map maker and as a map publisher, but not as a cartographer. World War I led to a need for draftsmen as men went off to work, I mean, went off to war, by the late 1910s, help wanted ads in the New York Times included calls for draft women. Intensive short courses were offered to train women as draftsmen in as short as 10 weeks. In Chicago in 1917, the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad offered a free course in engineering with openings for 50 girls. A year later, war emergency courses for women included classes at the University of Chicago on geographical and geological drafting. Iowa's State Highway Commission created a Women's Drafting Bureau as a part of the Department of Road Design in 1918. Um, they hired as its head Alma Alt Wilson, who graduated from Iowa State's engineering program. Members of the Women's Drafting Department served an apprenticeship, after which they were classified as draftswomen. From the State Highway Commission report of 1919, I estimate that 24 women were working for the department. This advancement of women into mapping fields appears to have held at least temporarily after World War I. A 1923 article on women's occupations um, by the Department of Labor estimates that the women working as draftsmen tripled from 1910 to 1920. Finally, were women ever described as explorers? Yes, to some extent. Women's accomplishments in exploration and mapping parts of the world were covered by the media. On the right, we have the very brief entry on Mary Schaefer, who's described in the New York Times as discovering and adding to the map a lake in the Canadian Rockies. And a more prominent example on the left is Fanny Bullock Workman. Fat Fanny and her husband, William, um, had various inheritances and went off and traveled the world and had massive adventures, eventually ending up in mountaineering in the Himalayas where they advanced seven expeditions between 1898 and 1912. They mapped, they photographed, they made scientific observations, um, they set records. The results of their expeditions were shared widely. They presented their findings at the Scottish Geographical Society, the Royal Geographical Society. Um, their adventures were covered in Harper's Magazine, National Geographic, New York Times. They published books, and this is the title page for the Two Summers in the Ice Wilds of Eastern Karakoram. And notice that Fanny is always listed as the first author. But not only that, she is also listed as the first author on the map. Now, this is a bit of questionable because they themselves did not do the surveying. They hired the surveyors, but they were very much taking possession of this knowledge and claiming authorship of this knowledge. In a 1924 book, Profitable Vocations for Girls, map making is included. Quote, many careful workers find good employment in making maps. Railroad maps are needed by travelers and shippers. Road maps are needed by automobilists and cyclists. Real estate maps are needed by home seekers. The measurements for these kind of various maps are, are made by surveyors and engineers. It is not difficult to take the figures of the field worker and put them into the form of a map. 
The worker must know how to use scale and must do absolutely accurate, correct, and painstaking work. Women were being encouraged to become map makers, and we might suggest that they are to produce maps to meet that high bar of the ideal map. But where are they in the history of cartography? Women's mapping was off the charts, literally. But we could argue that they are here. Through the work of scholars like Alice Hudson, Judy Tyner, Mary Ritzland, we know that, that women were involved in a variety of ways in the mapping industry as drafters, publishers, map sellers, editors, engravers, globe makers, printers, colorists. But their roles have been often obscured, their identities erased. They are in many ways latent in this graph. How might we reorganize this? Writing in 1937, Royce commented in Imago Mundi that those who most often receive the credit for important maps or charts are not necessarily those who do the work. Quote, maps are often named after the person who did the least work on them, such as the publisher or the chief of survey. He goes on that the author would appreciate every comment from those who studied a certain man or period in more detail. Maybe what we need is a new diagram of mapping in which this is just a part to shift the focus from cartography to mapping. As Matthew so lovely writes, from a historical perspective, cartography and all it implies is undoubtedly a product of a particular era in Western culture and is ill-suited as a label for a socially and culturally inclusive field of study. The history of cartography has for the most part been written by men. Men have been the gatekeepers of, of formal geographical knowledge for much of its history. As Cresswell has written, quote, the observation that there have been not many women of note in the discipline of geography then is only to say there have not been many women of note in a very narrowly defined notion of what counts as geography that has been defined, regulated, disciplined, and for the most part until recently by men. He continues, what counts as geography and as geographical science has been defined by men, and that women's work did not fit into the set of knowledge that was labeled geography at the time. This is very much part of the credentialing or professionalization of geography and cartography, but even more broadly of academic disciplines. Dennis Wood, writing about cartography, remarks, and this is his emphasis, the word seems only gradually to caught on or in precisely as the subject to which it was referred is making its way into the halls of academe. Imagine trying to justify a faculty position in map making. Cartography sounds so much more respectable. Words are power. During the progressive era, there are media accounts of women such as Laura Whitlock and Frances Lillian Blaze who are both described as the nation's first women map publishers, not cartographers, words are power. One of the elements that must be addressed, and this is to pick back up on Matthew's morning presentation, is the gendering of cartography, and it parallels the gaze between gazing at landscape and gazing at women. To take the measure of the land, to know the lay of the land, and to possess it parallels to gaze upon and to know women. Maps are a form of knowledge that professes to capture the truth about a place in pure scientific form. To map or graph a place is to de-virginalize the landscape. To, now it has known men, has been conquered, subdued. Often masculine exploratory traditions explicitly feminize land and peoples and call for the dominance through representation. And where do women fit into the picture? Women who map fit into this picture. Some feminist scholars working on documenting feminist mapping try to disrupt this gaze. Dalia Varenka, in her consideration of the English plain style, concludes with a reflection on feminine style mapping, stating that gender and feminist research suggest that it involves the importance of personal narratives and influence of interpersonal relationships, and to go on to suggest new ways of mapping. So just to kind of wrap this up, What I am struck by is, is language. Map, mapping, cartography, increasingly calls for feminist mapping, equitable mapping. So maybe Matthew is right. 
and we need to let go of these masculinist ideals of cartography and all that it very loaded term implies and to go embrace words as simple as they are of map and mapping and map history and which embraces the spectrum of map produce as well as consumers. And this gendering of cartography is not just a matter of history, but continues to be an important topic in our field today. Thank you.